Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Selena or Dr. Selena, for the uh, introduction. I just want to confirm that you can see me and that I am, uh, I am uh, spotlighted. So if you can see me, just, uh, just raise your hand. And if you can hear me well, just raise your hand. All right, I see some responses. Okay, cool. All right, today I would like to talk to you about typical Asian parents. Now, how many of you here have typical Asian parents? You know, uh, I'm sure you have heard of the term tiger mom, right? The, the tiger mom, and there is this book that went out that was really popular. Now, what, what if we switch it to dad? What would you call it? Lion dad? Dinosaur dad? You know, but today I want to talk to you about a different type of typical Asian parent. I want to talk to you about the parent that was the hero of their generation the genius of their generation. And they would share everywhere they go about their achievements and their accolades, how, how they raise you know, their family and their siblings and their, and their parents um, out of poverty and suffering. Can any of you relate to parents? Who, any of you relate to this kind of story? Because I can definitely um, relate to that. Both my parents were geniuses of their generation. You know, my dad's family, you know, if I can share a little bit, they were all high achievers. And you know how when you put kids through school, right, you, you kind of put kids all through the same, but you put one kid and then you say, okay, so the next kid should go to the same school because I had a good experience. And then boom, 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 every, as many kids as you have, you put them through the same school. And so, you know, my dad's family would literally compare scores across, even though they were so far apart, they would literally compare scores every day, every week to see who is the best out of all of them. Now, how many, of, how many siblings did my dad have, you might ask? 13. 13 of them would literally come home every day from school and say, okay, today I did this. I did this in my school. And they would compare notes and see who came up on top. And they compete in everything. They compete in their schooling life, as I just talked about. They competed in their marriages to see who married, uh, married better or married, uh, you know, well, married well. They competed in their careers to see who will come up on top. And because of that, his generation churned out you know, a couple of doctors. Um, they had uh, teachers as well, principals, and they all grew up to be well-respected people in society. My mom, on the other hand, Although, you know, her family was not as competitive, she was also the genius and hero of her family. Of her seven siblings, she was the only one to graduate with a bachelor's. She was the only one who, who topped her class each year from primary to high school to college to university and did not miss, catch this, okay, did not miss a single day of class. Single, not a single day, perfect attendance. You know, how many of you have parents like this? You know, and they turn to you, or, in, or to me in this case, as the eldest son and go, be the hero of your generation. Be the genius. You know, I had a great childhood growing up and I loved, you know, I loved, you know, growing up. But, you know, I was, you know, I, I started off as a really sickly child. And I still remember the first time, you know, I fell sick in primary school. I woke up kind of feeling all uh, wuzzy and the room was kind of spinning around and, and you know, and, and I, I dragged myself to the toilet You know, I was pulling a high fever and I, I just threw up into the, uh, you know, the toilet bowl, everything that I ate the night before. And as I dragged myself back to the bed, you know, the, you know, the time approaches where you have to really get out the door, otherwise you'd be late, right? And then, you know, my mom comes in. And, they, and, and she asked this, uh, this million dollar question all the time. Are you sure that you don't want to go to school? And time after time, every time I fell sick, she would sit me down and tell me how much she relished, enjoyed, looked forward to, made sure that she attended every single class. She would tell me the story of how, you know, when she was, a similar, it was, she was in a similar situation as I was, you know, pulling a high fever, throwing up, she would be, you know, she would literally be uh, outside her house waiting for the bus, uh, school bus to pull up and she would be throwing up into the garden. She would go up, go up onto the bus, get off the bus, throw up into the sidewalk, go to class, <laughs> run out of class and throw up into the drain next to the class. She would never miss a single class because she loved to study. That was her words. And after this story, 
right? She would then say, okay, now how about we bring you to dad and then he'll give you a quick injection and then you can go to school. Sounds familiar? Well, over time I grew up, I kind of grew up out of that phase. And other than that, I was pretty much the model trophy child in my family. You know, when it comes to academics, well, I wasn't the kind of, you know, student that would study 12 hours a day, memorize everything, work my butt off, you know, and I'm always in my books. Um, I wasn't the kind of student. I was the kid that you really, really hated. Why? Because I, you know, you would never see me studying. I'll always be playing, uh, you know, having fun. I'll always be doing what I wanted to do. But then when the exam comes around, I always get a good grade. I, w I, w I would be able to pick up a book, I'll pick up a subject, study it really quickly, understand it quickly, you know, get it down, get, get down to the root, understand it, and then get a good score. And if I put my heart and mind to something, I will be top in the school in that subject only because, you know, because I like the subject. And in high school, I was the kind of kid that, you know, that, 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 would, able, that would be able to charm and kind of sweet talk everybody from the gate guard, you know, get my way with a, with a, with a, with a, with a canteen lady uh, and all the way up to my discipline teachers and also the principal. I was on the good books of everybody. And it got so bad to a point where, you know, I was the only one in the entire school that could bring in my cell phone. And this was a big thing uh, back then because, you know, you can't bring a cell phone into school. And I, I brought in my, I was the only one that could bring in my cell phone into school just because, you know, I went up to the, uh, the, the principal and said, hey, I need to use my phone. I need to bring my phone around in school. And he let me do it. You know, let's talk about sports now. I wasn't the most athletic. I was good enough to be on the basketball team. You know, we played up to state level. And I also played pretty good uh, table tennis and soccer. I could also speak, pre speak pretty well. You know, I did lots of public speaking. I was on the debate team, uh, state debate team. And we, we were debating for, uh, for Penang. Uh, that's where I grew up. Um, and, you know, as every typical kind of Asian family, they always put you through music. I could play the piano, and I still do. I can play uh, the guitar, and I could sing professionally. Uh, I was part of, uh, you know, large chamber choirs, uh, and I even had my own uh, acapella group uh, you know, when I was a teenager. Uh, and we were doing our mini tours around, you know, the city, and we traveled uh, around some neighboring states as well. And we even had our own CD, and we sold it. And this is the kind of like late 90s to early 2000s. So you kind of have to be, you know, pretty good uh, if you can get something recorded and sold during that time. Out of all my 20 or 30 cousins, I was the only one the only one that got into medical school and was the only doctor in my entire generation, both paternal and maternal. So pretty much in all my communities growing up, you know, in my neighborhood, with my extended family, with my church family, you know, I was the kind of the hero of my generation. Now imagine, just imagine the shock and the horror and this belief when I announce that I will not continue in clinical medicine. You know, in everyone's eyes, and I'm quoting right here, they said, it's a quarter of a century gone down the drain. In a snap of a finger, in a blink of an eye, I had turned from the hero of my generation to the loser of my generation. You know, to, to make the long story short and to save you the details, that conversation ended with me not speaking to my parents for two, two full years. And pretty soon, you know, everyone sort of found out, right, through the grapevine. And I started getting, you know, bombarded with, you know, negative messages from family friends to relatives to ex-teachers. Family reunions were the worst. You know, I'll not speak to my family for the whole year and I, you know, you have to show up, right? Uh, to, to reunion at least for a couple of hours. And I'll show up and, you know, you would just hear someone say to no one in particular to the air, you know, say, hey, they would shout out loud, hey, can you advise me on my heart disease? And then you hear someone else say to no one else in particular, oh, no, you can't because, you know, you've decided not to be a doctor anymore. And that really, really struck me hard. And, you know, when you, when you and, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about when I say, it's silence that scares you the most. Because, you know, in a typical Asian family, right, you, 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 you know when your parents are mad because they, they tell you, like, they tell you by scolding you, right? They get mad, you know it because, you know, they, make, they make, a, make a fuss out of it and all that and you'd be thinking, ah, yeah, they're angry and they'll get over it. But it's when they're the most silent, that's when the stuff 
is serious, when everything is just quiet. And you know, it's, it's, it's funny because you know, in the midst of that silence, I still remember one day in that first year, I received a text message from my mom. You know, I was sitting there in my bachelor pod, uh, tiny room. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was cut off. I was living off the salary of my, uh, of my wife. And, and, you know, then, um, and it, it was a pretty bad week, I still remember. And I was just trying to shut out all the negative thoughts in my mind. I received this text message. My phone, my phone kind of buzzes, right? Now, you know that feeling you have when, like, your phone buzzes and you just, like, you see the person there, right, from, from far. And you, you don't want to, so, you know, you don't want to open the message and you don't want to see what's on it. But anyway, eventually, you know, you know, you kind of muster up your courage and, you know, I looked at the message and, you know, it, it only had four words and it said, mom is, mom is proud of you. Mom's proud of you. And, you know, at that time, I just, you know, I just pushed it all aside because, you know, all I was hearing from them was, you're wasting your time. When will you be a doctor again? You know, uh, you, you know you're 25 years down, gone, gone down the drain. Uh, you, can, you, you can't even, you know, we can't go to you for anything. We can't rely on you on anything. If you let us all down, you're useless. You're a loser. And, you know, and part of me really, you know, and I was just pushing that aside, but part of me kind of still felt a little guilty, right? Unfilial, if you could use that word. Because, you know, really, if you think about it, we are what we are because of what our parents put into us. You know, and as much as we don't want to believe it, as much as media tries to push us, or modern media tries to push us to believe that we're solely responsible for who we are, but really, if you think about it, during our teens and during our formative years, who and what we are is solely because of, of our environment, and our environment is built by our parents. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, um, even though, you know, I was feeling down and negative and in a really dark space, you know, I still had a measure of peace because I knew that I would not regret this decision five, 10, 15 years down the road. Well, anyway, life went on and, you know, I, I, I maintained the, the career switch and the decision that I made. And I spent the next four years really fixing my relationship with my parents slowly, but surely, right? The venture that I co-founded slowly started gaining traction. And along the way, I learned so much. I learned that there are layers upon layers of learning to do. I learned that, you know, right outside our doctor to patient relationship, it's a whole world of systems, protocols that speak to each other and make up our healthcare system. I learned that outside of that, there are health institutions, right? And there are organizations, hospitals, and leaders of those organizations think dif differently. And I had to learn how they think. You know, beyond that, you know, beyond that, there were groups of stakeholders, interdependent industries that I had to learn the thinking of as well. And beyond even that, you have global groups, communications that go beyond borders that you need to learn. You know, I learned how to start a venture without any capital support. I learned how to recruit, hire, keep a diverse team of people that, you know, unlike many of us here, you know, they can quit. They can drop hop anytime and nobody would judge them for it. I learned that, you know, my expertise and my status as an expert um, ends the moment I step out of the hospital door. I learned how to remove that title from, you know, from before my name so that I can learn from someone else. I learned how to humble myself. I learned how to be a student again. I learned how to do startups. I learned fundraising. I learned, you know, business jargon. I learned finance, legal, tech development. I need to learn some, some tech, uh, you know, development languages even. I need to learn how to market, how to sell, how to storytell, how to speak. And I learned how to present myself and what I do in different lights simultaneously. And I still remember the turning point for me. Towards the end of these four years, I received another text message from my mom. And then this time, well, a lot had happened already. You know, my dad had, you know, recently almost passed away uh, during that time from sepsis, from an unknown cause. And a lot of my parents' siblings had begun, you know, uh, passing away as well as they went into their 70s and their 80s. And, uh, you know, one day after a long day of firefighting, I was just exhausted, right? Um, I was ready to turn in for the night. It was a very bad time. We were about to burn down to the ground. Um, and... You know, it was really tough and, you know, you just, you know, you're in that space where you just, you know, you're just going along and you don't want to, you just don't want to, uh, 
you just don't want to, to receive anything else, right? And then, you know, my phone rings, uh, kind of buzzes again. And it's, it's five minutes before my, you know, my do not disturb comes on. And I was just kind of annoyed, right, that the, that the notification came in. And I see, you know, the, the title there, mom. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, mom again, right? What, what's she going to say? Is she going to, you know, in my mind, I was just preparing myself for just a, you know, yes, she wasn't so negative, but she still once in a while, she would come on and on again and try to convince me, you know, to go back uh, into, uh, go back into uh, uh, clinical medicine. And, it, you know, that feeling of, that feeling of, I just don't want to hear another negative message. You know, but I looked at it eventually. And at that moment, it was as if time stopped. It was as if, you know, I received this message from a different world, a different time, a different space, a different galaxy, a different universe. You know, and I, you know, I felt kind of, you know, that, you know, the sense of when, you know, your heart starts getting louder in your head, right? And, and, and you know, and your, your, you know, you feel like shivers going down, going, going down from your head towards your toes. Because that message read, again, mom is proud of you. And at that moment, tears started pouring down my face. I started sobbing, crying. As the realization hit me, and again, I realized that I once again was the hero of my generation. And I know that, you know, Selena has said that, you know, I can promote, you know, the, the enterprise and the startup that I'm running and the services that we have. And yes, there's a lot to talk about, you know, as we are, we are working with doctors right now, clinics, and, you know, and just last week we started, you know, rather we signed on with uh, IGN and there are some other hospitals on the pipeline. But, you know, today I won't be spending any, t any of that time uh, doing that because I know many of you have come here because you are yearning for change. You have come here because you have arrived at this crossroad and you don't, and you want, you know, you, you're, you're yearning to take, or you're yearning or wishing that you could take that leap, but you, you're unsure if you should do it or not. And many of you are yearning for, you know, maybe a change of pace, or perhaps maybe life is now requiring too much of you, right? You know, with family, uh, responsibly, with more, more kids and, you know, other interests that are coming in, you realize that your life is more than just, you know, your, 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 you know, climbing up the medical ladder. Now, and I really want to challenge you guys today. There is no better time to chase your dreams than today. Today is where, you know, somebody once said to me, today is the least responsibility that you will ever have. Meaning tomorrow you will have, like tomorrow your responsibilities will be more than today. That's what it means. Today is the day that you have the least responsibilities. If you have a dream, I want to challenge you to take that leap. Why? Because everybody is behind you, even if you feel they are not. Now, in closing, I'd like to share a video that was very close to my heart. I have saved it, downloaded it, favorited it, watched it many, many, many times. It's a simple video that, you know, that, that not many people know about. But I want to share it with you. And I'd like you, to, as you watch it, right, think about, you know, think about your life and what is important to you and what you want to leave in your legacy. I'd like to share that with you. Now, if you can see my screen, if, if I can ask if you show or just raise your hand really quickly so I can see that. Okay. All right. So I'll just make this full screen. Let me see how I do that. There we go. Oh, one sec. I just need to make sure that I'm sharing sound. There we go. Oopsie. Okay. 
I think we all need pep talk. The world needs you to stop being boring. Yeah, you. Boring is easy. Everybody can be boring. But you're good at that. Life is not a game, people. Life isn't a cereal either. Well, it is a cereal. And if life is a game, are we all on the same team? I mean, really, right? I'm on your team. Be on my team. This is life, people. You got air coming through your nose. You got heartbeat. That means it's time to do something. A poem. Two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the road less traveled. It hurt, man! Really bad. Rocks, thorns, and glass. My pants broke. Wah! Not cool, Robert Frost. But what if there were really were two paths? I won't be in the one that leads to awesome. It's like that dude Journey said, don't stop believing unless you dream stupid. Then you should get a better dream. I think that's how it goes. Get a better dream and keep going. Keep going, keep going, and keep going. Will Michael Jordan have quit? Well, he did quit. No, he retired. Yeah, that's he retired. But before that, in high school, what if he quit when he didn't make the team? He would have never made Space Jam. And I love Space Jam. What will be your Space Jam? What will you create will make the world awesome? Nothing if you keep sitting there. That's why I'm talking to you today. This is your time. This is my time. It's our time. We can make every day better for each other. But if we're all on the same team, let's start acting like it. We got work to do. We can cry about it or we can dance about it. We were made to be awesome. Let's get out there. I don't know everything. I'm just a kid. But I do know this. It's everybody's duty to give the world a reason to dance. So get to it. Awesome. Okay, Sean, um, actually right. there's two questions for you. Um, mm. Someone asked, what made you decide to change your career? Is that the only question? Uh, oh, the other one is, uh, tell us a bit about your startup venture, how the idea came about and what did you have to do to put that idea into reality? Okay. Um, well, I'll try to summarize a little bit because I realized that we do have a time limit, right, Selena? So um, the first question, what made me decide to change my career? Well, um, I, have, I, have, I always had a pretty keen interest um, in, uh, in public health um, and in lifestyle, kind of lifestyle change. Now, the green light really for me was when I realized that, um, that I could actually affect the root of disease, which is rooted in, you know, in behavior and in lifestyle change. So, you know, it's where I'm talking about, you know, the majority of patients that are sitting in the hospitals having all those comorbidities like, you know, heart disease and diabetes and, 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 and you know, high blood pressure and high cholesterol and everything that comes with that cocktail, right? Um, all these is nailed down to, you know, to the lifestyle. All the, uh, all the procedures and the, and, the, uh, and, the, and the medications that we give controls the symptoms, but they do not address the root. And you know, what really made me change was when I sat down with one of my patients that time uh, for two years. Okay? I went to his house um, every couple of weeks, helped him change. And I saw a man go from you know, awaiting a heart bypass to a slim, fit, 65 year old Taylor that had 20, 30 years ahead of him to see his grandkids be born. And that was really a light bulb for me. And I said, Hey, you know, I got to step up. Um, I need to do something more than what I'm doing now. The second, uh, the answer to the second question, right? Um, so just try to summarize what we, what we do um, here at Silver of Life. We simply make the effort of planning and executing a healthy lifestyle, easy for anybody. 
So with that comes everything, right? Uh, we are in we're in a little everything. We have uh, we have an app, we have coaches, we have a meal plan, we have deliveries, we have uh, we have online education, we have uh, we have free uh, free awareness talks, and we do a lot of corporate uh, stuff. But compressed into a nutshell, we are helping people uh, change their lifestyles for good and reverse the disease permanently. How did I get that idea into reality? Well, a lot of pain, a lot of sweat. Uh, and a lot of work. Um, I maybe can share a little bit more about the growth process, but I think um, to what it took definitely was a lot, a lot of sacrifice. Um, you know, and I, and I guess from my story, you can kind of guess the implication, right? Uh, being kicked out of family, where being knocked out of support. You know, I started this without you know a cent from any of my uh, any of my family members or family friends. Because uh, I told myself, look, well, they were all coming at me from negative spaces and it was a dark time. And so I just didn't want to take, you know, add on this kind of burden of, you know, finance stuff. And so, you know, I did everything with strangers. Uh, and so that took a lot of sacrifice, you know, uh, didn't pull a salary for one and a half years, uh, living off my wife's salary, which isn't that much. Um, and, um, and there was a lot of sacrifice of time, of effort, sweat, blood and tears. But looking back, um, you know, it's worth it because now I can choose. I can choose to be home. I can choose where I work. I can choose, uh, you know, I can choose to pursue interests that uh, I wasn't able to pursue before. Um, you know, I, I can choose to do things that, you know, that, you know, it, my, my personal interests, you know, financial interests, creative interests, um, interests of, uh, of the family, of my wife, uh, other things that we want to do because there's a lot more to life, you know, than, uh, than, than, you know, then, then going to work each day. And so we had to sacrifice that in the beginning, but looking back, it's definitely, uh, was definitely a, a, worth, a worthwhile transition. But what do you think the first step is, like say if a doctor wants to, like has an idea, like what, what would the first step be like for them? What would your advice be for them? Um, it would vary, but my advice would be find a way to test your idea without your employers knowing. Uh, find a way, you know, to, 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 to test out or rather to, and that could be as simple as making a conversation with the right person, right? You know, think about who might be interested in your idea or somebody that's within that space of your idea and talk to them, right? Just bounce some ideas. Uh, and, and cause you don't want your, like, you know, some of you might be in private, private, uh, practice, right? So you're hired by, uh, by the hospital a private hospital, or, you know, you're working the ER as a, as a, as a long-term MO, or maybe you're working up, you know, working up the steps in a still in service, but you know, you really don't want your employees to know what you're doing. You just want to carve out that time during your post nights or your, uh, or your, um, or your free time to test your idea in the smallest way possible without anybody finding out. And so, you know, and you slowly build that up, right? Begin by conversations, from conversations, start running surveys, you know, and I, don't tell me you can't hire an intern. They cost way less, right? Get them, get some friends, uh, some, some fresh graduates to help, you know, help, you know, do some surveys for you, call people, right? You can even do the calls yourself, um, you know, uh, and start testing it out. And if there seems to be a, uh, you know, a response or you seem to kind of hit a jackpot, um, then, you know, take the lead. I'm the, I'm the kind of throw yourself in the deep end kind of guy. So, you know, the, the, you know, it may not work for everybody. So, you know, listen to what I say, but don't do as I do. Right. Uh, you know, it may not work for everybody. So I, what I did was I just threw myself into the deep end. So that's just like, okay, drop the job. Now I don't have a salary, so I have to get something going. Right. And literally I would just, you know, spend like I would, you know, at that time at the very beginning, I spent six months just sitting in, so some of you may be familiar, familiar with Magic, the uh, ent entrepreneur kind of innovation capital of Malaysia there in Putrajaya. So I would cap myself from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. as a visitor in the cafeteria and speak to everybody that walked in because I want to do a startup, right? So I want to know how they, did, how they did things. And so I would speak to everybody and just say, hey, I'm just, you know, this guy trying to do this thing, right? What, are, what is your thoughts? Or, or how do you start up your thing? And just speak to people for six months. Um, and through that and through, uh, you know, being very active on LinkedIn, and that's something I did as well. So other than magic, I went on LinkedIn 
and just connect it with as many people as my free uh, free thing would uh, my free subscription or unpaid LinkedIn would allow me to and and make uh, set up meetings with all of them. Why? Just to speak to them uh, about my idea. Um, and and uh, and after a while, right, of hammering at it away at it, and because of the urgency that you have, because you don't have money, right, uh, you need to you know uh, eat and buy food and pay rent, and so that drives you to accelerate that process, and it's painful, uh, but you know, but it's definitely uh, very rewarding. Now, I realize that what I'm saying here is very specific for somebody that wants to jump out and start their own thing, right? I know that some of you here may not be so interested in that. You're just looking for a change in pace, right? You might be looking for maybe a non-clinical job. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, in that case, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what I'm doing here, throwing yourself on the deep end, you know, you could find yourself out uh, in the open without a job for a long time, but you could still, you know, spend time in upskilling yourself, right? Taking courses, uh, taking, uh, you know, other, other things that are, uh, start experimenting with uh, some things that are maybe not so mainstream. Like in, in my time, uh, you know, out, jump, since jumping out, I've, I've come across very interesting things. And I'm sure that if, if you've been with Medic Footprints for long enough, you would meet with doctors that are doing very interesting things. Uh, they may still be running a clinic, but they're doing something a little different with their clinic, right? And you know what I'm talking about. It's not the day-to-day -day patient coming uh, to them. They're, they're selling things that are really groundbreaking uh, and, they're, and they're doing things that are, you know, really interesting. Um, and so, and so perhaps, right, throwing yourself out in the deep end is not really uh, applicable to everybody. But for those of you that are thinking to do startup, um, definitely, uh, definitely, uh, definitely for me, what worked for me was throwing myself out there. But you can also do it step by step. And that is, the first step is still, you know, you got to test your idea. And, uh, you know, to keep yourself safe, do that without anyone knowing. Okay, someone's asking, uh, should I do housemanship if I want to work in a non-clinical sector? That is an interesting question. Um, it depends on what cl non-clinical sectors that, uh, that you're looking at. Uh, I remember back in university, uh, I spearheaded the committee to launch the first ever non-clinical career meeting. Okay, hint, hint, I already had an idea back then. Uh, and we invited speakers from across Malaysia. And I think your boss, uh, Selena, was there as well, uh, your chairman. Uh, and, um, and we had some other doctors that have done, uh, done uh, non-clinical non careers as well. Um, uh, their, their overall advice, so their overall advice was that it really depends on what sort of non-clinical sector you're looking to go into. So, you know, if you're thinking, you know, research, right, or education, uh, then, you know, uh, then, uh, but it's still within like, you know, you still got to teach like clinical stuff and all that. Then, you know, you likely want to finish your housemanship and get the, uh, get the, uh, get your APC, right? Uh, but however, if you're looking to do, to go into startups or you're looking to become a medical advisor, advisor, right? In uh, pharmaceuticals and IOT companies, uh, in, um, in, uh, oh, sorry, the words, what is, uh, I'm losing that right now. Uh, so IOTs, uh, pharmaceuticals, and medical underwriting. Now that's, that's the one. Insurance companies. Uh, then you may not need housemanship because they need somebody that, that just you know, knows medical jargon and can validate uh, reports. So, so you will not need that. And if you're going to startups, for sure, right? You don't need, uh, you don't need uh, housemanship. But for me, um, I think the, the, your choice between housemanship and non-housemanship should be based down to your decision or rather your interest uh, in clinical medicine as a whole. Like for me, I still like clinical medicine, right? So it was, to me, it wasn't between something that I hated and something that I loved. It was more something that was good and something that was better, right? So it was even, it's even harder decision because I still like clinical medicine, right? Uh, and whenever, like, you know, in the past year, I had, I had the opportunity to step back in the hospital, uh, you know, not to be a doctor, but to, uh, you know, to help out, uh, you know, my in-laws who, who had a relative in there uh, that was, you know, suffering from late stage cancer. So I had to be the liaison and make sure that, you know, specialists are doing their work and kind of try to hammer them a little bit. Uh, and, you know, memories start flooding back and, I, you know, I, I still feel the rush. I still enjoy clinical medicine. Uh, and so if you're that kind of person and you still enjoy what you do, it's just kind of the, uh, the culture that you don't like, 
then and you know that you still be involved in clinical medicine in some way or in healthcare in some way, I would suggest uh, that you go ahead and do your housemanship because it's still something that you love. So the, 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 the enjoyment that you get when you actually heal a patient, right, in surgery or whatever, or some, some, some 14 year old guy comes in with a RTA or, uh, and then he's, you know, he's, he's, he's going down to, to brain death and you, you, your team cures him and he, you know, he walks out and then he comes back with a, with a, with a card. You know, those things will pull you through housemanship. Right, uh, but if you're the kind of guy that dreads right all form of clinical work and patient, a doctor patient, you know, work and procedures and all that, and you just hate it, then you know I suggest you just don't go through because of what your family says or what people tell you. It's not just two years. It's not just four years. You know, things will come. Now it's just finished housemanship. Then it will be just finish, uh, just finish your masters. Then it will be just you know get your specialist. Then it's become a consultant. It never ends, right? Uh, and so if you're not a clinical medicine guy, I would suggest you know forget it. Don't 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 go down that path. You know, spear out a different path. And I and I have many friends that who have done that as well. Okay, someone's uh, asking um if you would share a little bit about your public health interests and how do you link that to society through your company. Um, I might need a little help unpacking that. I'm not so sure what, uh, what the question is. I uh, think means. what they're meaning is um, like with your background in public health, like how does your company help like um, the community? I, I guess they're asking more about what is it that your what company does. Like that? Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. How does it help the community? Um, okay, so, so my background in public health, so after I, uh, I left, I went on to do a, in a sense, a board exam specialty, but not recognized in Malaysia, of course, uh, but only recognized in the US in lifestyle medicine. Um, and this really was because I had no, like, okay, yeah, I told you about the patient that I helped, right? But that's, that's, that's the limit of my knowledge, right? Uh, I know that, like, and we all know, right, as doctors that people need healthy, you know, and, you know, the, the typical line that we give to, uh, to you know, the guy with hypertension, ah, oh, you just eat less salt, ah, right? Or oh, we just refer them to a dietitian, right? So we have no idea, or I have no idea how to prescribe or how lifestyle medicine works and what the evidence is in that field. And so that's why I went in to kind of upskill myself uh, and to learn more. And so after that, 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 that course and after I did the board exam, um, uh, you know, I came out a lot more confident. So there's a lot, there's a lot more that, you know, that, that's being done as well uh, uh, there. And, you know, that, that board exam really helped me, uh, helped me, you know, get up to speed in a sense. Because uh, doctors, at least in Asia, are not specialized in, uh, in, in, in this area. Um, so, so using that, uh, you know, we, we have started a... Um, kind of a social, you can call it, yeah, we call ourselves a social enterprise because we're more about, more about impact. Uh, and if you look at the stuff that we do on our social media and, uh, you know, and our services, a lot of it is very community-based, meaning that it's either at no cost, a free, or at minimal or nothing, uh, kind of nothing to everybody because we want to help as many people as possible. And so, um, you know, like, I'll just give you one example of, uh, two, two examples maybe of community work that we have done. Uh, the first one uh, is that we did free uh, health screenings and free health talks with free food tastings with no strings attached um, in corporate spaces for about six or seven months before the, uh, the coronavirus hit. And in that time, you know, we got about four to 5,000 people on board our education program uh, where we would go into their workspaces and to give, uh, to give, you know, to get people to, and split them to small groups and do focus groups with them to help them overcome their challenges of changing their lifestyle. And, you know, and, and we did this at absolutely uh, no cost uh, to the, uh, to the participant. Um, uh, and, you know, that was, you know, that was one of the key reasons why the you know, companies, you know, and when they see the stuff that we're doing, right, uh, you know, they, they realize that, you know, we just want to help. And, uh, and the, the other thing that we did was also during the, uh, during the coronavirus, when, uh, when the MCO was first announced, um, you, know, uh, you know, I saw all these stories of, uh, of, uh, of the young doctors uh, wanting to go. And I see my juniors uh, being pulled out, uh, being called to Sungai Bulo uh, in, with one or two days notice. And we launched kind of a community campaign. Right to serve uh, to serve therapeutic meals uh, to to this uh, to these doctors in uh, in in Sunai Bulo and HKL, and and uh, and and you know at the very beginning right we had no funds right for this and as a small startup it's really dangerous to do this kind of thing because you can easily 
easily in the heat of the moment burn yourself to the ground. But you know, even with that risk, we went ahead uh, and did that. And we send the food uh, at cost to ourselves, and you know it was a blessing that you know you know the you know and 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 we were so surprised we weren't expecting this. The public kind of rallied behind us, and we got a lot uh, you know enough money to sort of cover all our costs. Uh, well, not all of it, but most of it. Uh, but still, that was one of the ways. One of the other ways that you know one of the examples that you know we we really pulled uh, pulled ourselves apart uh, to help the people around us. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sean. That was very, very insightful. Uh, if anybody wants to connect with you, how can they get uh, in touch? Uh, just to connect, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, oh, this is one thing I noticed, right? Doctors don't like to be on LinkedIn. So if you want to be on, you want to be non-clinical, you have to have a LinkedIn profile, okay? So go create a LinkedIn profile, put your profile picture, put every single set you have done in, in, you know, in your lifetime and everything that you are planning to do, just put it on there, right? And, uh, and yeah, connect with me. Uh, because LinkedIn is where most of my networking goes on and the most effective networking goes on. So connect with me on LinkedIn. But if you don't have a LinkedIn and you want to speak to me personally, uh, you can email me. Uh, I can just share, uh, you can email me at, uh, yeah, I can just say it out loud, right, Selena? Mm, yep. uh, my email is S-H-A-U-N, Sean, um, Elias, saverofLife.com. That's saver in the U.S. spelling without the U. Saver, S-A-V-O-R, O-F-L-I-F-E dot com. Sean at saverofLife.com. And now uh, we can set up, you know, more conversations after that if you need to speak to me further. Okay, okay. I think that's all the question there is. Thank you so much, Sean, for your time. Um, that was very, very insightful. Thank you so much. I hope you good luck on your venture. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Selena. Okay. And see you. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>